Yeah, okay. I think uh, we are uh, for court now. So maybe I, 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 I guess uh, start. So thanks everyone for uh, attending our NLP seminar today. Uh, today, we are very glad to invite uh, uh, Patrick from University College London and Facebook AI to give a talk of us. Uh, and uh, uh, he will give a talk about uh, uh, PAQ, uh, 65 million probably asked questions and what you can do with them. Okay, so uh, so to begin with, uh, we will first uh, start to introduce uh, Patrick for you. So, uh, so Patrick is a final year PhD student uh, in University College London and Facebook AI in London, uh, supervised by uh, Sebastian Riddle. Uh, Patrick's research lies on uh, knowledge in sensitive natural language processing, and uh, his recent work has won uh, best paper awards at both AKBC 2020 and EACL uh, in this year. Um, so uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's welcome uh, Patrick uh, to give his uh, talk for us. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. I will uh, get sharing. Um, and hopefully it all works out. Let's see. Can you guys see that? Yeah, I can see. Oh, yes, okay, yes. Great. Uh, awesome. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much for, for having me and thanks for the, the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so so my, my name is Patrick. Uh, I'm going to give a talk today about, uh, I guess it covers a couple of different papers, but it's mostly going to be focusing on, on this uh, recent paper that we talked about just before uh, called PAC, or probably ask questions, PAQ. Um, and I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, probably, um, and then we can have questions. Um, I guess the way the talk is structured, it's probably best to wait for questions at the end. Um, if we do have lots of questions, maybe I'll try and finish with about 20 minutes so we can get into it. And um, I'll be hanging around. Uh, after the talk yeah, people. I think I, I think you have you can uh, give a 45 minutes talk and we have 15 minutes QA. And for, for those who are uh, want to have a further discussion with you, we, we have an additional 30 uh, minutes. So uh, So for those of you who want to have a deep chart with Patrick, uh, you, you are welcome to stay. Yeah, that, that's our Ooh. plan. Yeah, sounds great. Let's start. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so this is kind of joint work with, um, I guess, a lot of people uh, in UCL and uh, Facebook Area Research in London, uh, but particularly my, my co-authors, um, Yushuang uh, and Lenching as PhD students, and then uh, research engineers, uh, Heinrich and uh, Ola, and then my supervisors Pontus and, and Sebastian uh, for this particular work. And it's focusing on the on the domain or, or the task of open domain question answering, uh, which I, I guess some of you probably, probably work on or are familiar with. Um, but the way I like to think about it, I like this quote uh, from the organizers of Efficient QA uh, from Europe last year, um, where they say that open domain question answering is, an, is emerging as a benchmark method for measuring systems abilities to read, represent, and retrieve knowledge expressed in all of the documents in the web. And this is the thing I'm really, really interested in, this idea of how to represent, store, and retrieve knowledge in, in the best way. Um, and open domain question answering kind of breaks down into the form of uh, questions and answers. So uh, typically in the benchmarks that we use, like natural questions or trivia QA, um, the task is given some short natural language questions, usually factoids, um, give that to a model and see how well a model can come up with a short entity like answer or a date or a number. So here, here are some examples from, from natural questions in, in case you're not familiar with the task. Um, in terms of uh, approaches that people commonly use uh, for open domain question answering, there are kind of two main approaches in the literature right now. Uh, there's the so-called retrieve and read uh, method, where we'll have a question that will come in, and then we'll have, say, a retriever model or, or, or component that will retrieve relevant information from a, a corpus of knowledge, say, like a Wikipedia dump or something like that. And that could be a, um, you know, a heuristic or, or kind of traditional information retrieval system implemented with TFIDF or BM25 or something learned in neural like the dense passage retriever. Um, and then we'll have these documents that are kind of relevant to the question, and then we'll feed them into some kind of reader or answer generator model. So that could be a kind of BERT uh, machine reading comprehension model, or you can kind of think of the whole thing together like a, a retrieval augmented generator, or there's a latest state-of-the-art system called Fusion in Decoder. 
And this approach is tends to be you know, highly accurate um, and relatively interpretable because you can look and see the documents that have been retrieved and get some kind of like evidence for the answer that you've been given for your model. But unfortunately, it's going to be quite slow and these models are going to be very large um, and complicated, I guess, because it's quite difficult to train these things end to end. Um, a different approach is called closed book question answering, uh, where you'll have access to a large pre-trained seek to seek model. Um, so like T5, BARS or GPT, whatever. And this large pre-trained seek to seek model has supposedly at this pre-training time uh, through its uh, uh, pre-training, its loss function, kind of acquired lots of knowledge about the world and stored it in its parameters. Um, and then, so what we want to do then is kind of imagine it as a sort of uh, neural sort of continuous parametric knowledge base in a sense. And all we need to do is fine tune it in such a way that when we ask it a question, it can kind of reach into its parameters and retrieve the kind of knowledge for us. And so at training time, what you'll do is take a corpus of question answer pairs, like the one on the first slide, and fine tune the seek to seek model uh, so that when you give it a question, it will generate a token, uh, an answer out for you, sort of token by token. Uh, and so at test time, it's very easy to query, just give it a question and it will generate an answer for you. Um, this is in some sense, you know, a, a fair bit less accurate right now than retrieve and read. Um, and represents a kind of black box. So it's very difficult to, to understand uh, why a particular answer has been given and kind of get some kind of visibility on, on where that answer has come from. But on the flip side, it's going to be much faster in general uh, than retrieve and read. Um, and in general, this isn't always true. Uh, generally, a smaller model, um, which can be like, you know, good if you're um, maybe hardware constrained. What I want to introduce in this talk is a slightly different approach. And it centers around uh, this resource or this kind of uh, set of uh, questions and answers, a set of question answer pairs, um, which we call PAC. And it's very, very large. It's 65 million, uh, what we call probably asked questions. And we call them probably asked questions because they weren't actually asked. Uh, we generated them automatically. Uh, and we did this by taking a Wikipedia dump and building this pipeline, uh, automatic pipeline that will look for passages that seem to have like information that might be relevant or interesting to a test time user or question asker and uh, select those passages and then extract likely answers from those passages, then generate likely questions uh, for those answers and then provide some kind of um, uh, filtering to ensure the quality of those generated questions is quite high. And later on, we'll talk about how important it is to get that filtering correct. Um, and we can use this to generate this really big set of question and answer pairs. Uh, and you can use, the, use them in a kind of number of different ways. You can think of them as this sort of general linguistic resource, I guess. Um, one thing you can do with them is just treat them as kind of standard uh, training data. So kind of like data augmentation for, um, you know, standard question answer, open domain question answering training data sets. So natural questions has 100,000 uh, question and answer pairs and PAC has 65 million. So you could think, oh, it's just like a really good training set for my QA model to use. And you can do that. So like we can say, try and uh, use it uh, to supervise a, a closed book QA model, or in fact, any type of QA model, but we use closed book models in our, in our paper. And if you do that, you'll see you know, improvements for that closed book QA model, that's cool. But the thing I'm more interested in is thinking about this kind of new way or, or maybe not new way, but sort of revisiting um, or recontextualizing this idea of a, of a question answer pair retriever as a different way of doing question answering in the, for open domain question answering, where say we'll have a question that will be asked and what this model, which I'm gonna call Repack will do is retrieve the most similar question from this really big knowledge base of question answer pairs, kind of treating these question answer pairs as a semi-structured knowledge base and retrieve the most similar questions to that uh, input question and then return the answer um, of the most similar question. And if we do that and we combine this pack set of question answer pairs, treating it as a knowledge base and this repack question uh, QA pair retriever, we'll end up with a, a question answering system, which is not only highly accurate in the sense that it can get about 47, 48% performance on natural questions. Um, it'll also enable us to unlock some very efficient question answering uh, inference. Um, and we've uh, used that to, to um, a good effect to win two um, tracks of the efficient QA competition in, in, in 2020. 
It also allow you to do very fast question answering if that's what's important to you. So being able to process up to thousands of questions per second, um, if you want a sort of acceptable accuracy and not really, really high accuracy. Uh, and then finally, you can get this very nice interpretable question answering uh, behavior uh, because you can return the single best matched question answer pair to the user. Um, and they can see whether the question answer pair that's been matched to what they asked is a fair paraphrase of what they asked. And you can even trace back to the passage that was generated from. So it's kind of good from that uh, interpretive point of view. And then finally, we get this really interesting behavior in terms of being very well calibrated um, in the sense that uh, Repack is very good at knowing when it doesn't know. And the confidence score that it assigns its answers correlates very well with whether it's likely to get that answer correct or not. And that's very useful if you want, say, like a precise question answering system into threshold by confidence score. Um, and we can use that to see, say, if we, we uh, build our models so that we want them to answer approximately 50% of questions and uh, abstain from answering a uh, 50% based on when it doesn't think it's going to answer this correctly. And if we do that and look at that kind of way of operating, we can see about a 10% improvement over state of the art, uh, a state of the art system uh, using Repack here. And the last thing we can do with this is kind of combine Repack uh, with a slower, uh, more deliberate retrieve and read state of the art system. Uh, and how this will work is because um, Repack is so well calibrated, we can say, take a question, ask it to Repack, it can uh, come up with an answer. And then if that answer confidence is high, we can then return that answer. But if the answer confidence is below a sort of user defined threshold, we can then back off uh, to say the slow state of the art approach to provide a, a, a different answer. Um, and this will allow us to so, sort of combine the strengths of both of these fast and slow systems. And we'll end up with something which is faster than state of the art system, but also more accurate. So it's kind of this interesting, um, combination uh, compared to they simply just ensembling them, which we wouldn't get this speed up. Um, so that's the kind of overview of the talk. That's the kind of things you can do with PAC. And in the next few uh, um, slides or next next few minutes, I'm going to unpack a lot of these different things. Um, and we'll kind of revisit each of these um, components. Uh, but first, I actually want to take a step back and kind of motivate why generating PAC is, is maybe a good idea in the first place. Um, so I want to start by uh, in the section by thinking about question answering competencies or kind of behaviors that we want our models to be able to exhibit and how they answer questions and what kinds of questions they can answer. And we're going to define three types of, of behavior or competency here. Uh, the first is what I'm going to call question memorization. So here, like, you know, a very basic behavior we want our systems to have is to be able to answer questions that are paraphrases of their training questions. So simply to recall answers to questions they've seen before from training time. So an example might be that if we had a training set which had a training question in it, who's hosting the Super Bowl in 2019 with the answer Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and then at test time, I asked the model, where will the Super Bowl be in 2019? The model should be able to recognize that it's seen that question before in a slightly different surface form and then provide the answer to that question. So this is kind of like maybe a minimum requirement or something that we'd really expect and hope all of our models to be able to do very well. Something slightly more challenging would be something that I'm gonna call answer classification. Uh, and so this would be maybe answering novel questions at test time, but using answer entities or answer uh, uh, strings that they've seen before at training time. So here, say if we have you know, that same training question, and then at test time, I ask who hosted the 1996 Olympic games, um, the model can sort of think over its training set and see, you know, or maybe I've seen um, uh, a, a city that's associated with sport um, and maybe the answer is Atlanta and I can sort of classify over all of my answers that I have from my training set and think that Atlanta might be the most likely one. And, you know, this is actually a, a, a potentially a fairly common thing that you'll see as well because, um, uh, you know, you might not have an exact paraphrase of a test question in the training set, but you can sometimes maybe work it out from, from reasoning over your um, answer entities that you have seen at training time. So this is kind of like the medium difficulty competency. And then the third uh, hardest one, which is kind of like the pure kind of question answer genera generalization, where we have to answer an entirely novel question at test time with an answer string or answer uh, uh, entity that I've not seen in my training set at all. 
So for example, um, say like, you know, uh, the test question might be who plays the voice of Maui and Moana with the answer Dwayne Johnson. Neither, no paraphrases of that question appear in our training set and Dwayne Johnson doesn't appear anywhere as an answer in our training set either. And so if we think about like maybe how common are each of these different um, types of, of question answering competency needed to do well on say a test set of, um, of open domain question answering data sets, we can look and, and sort of examine them. And the way we did this is we're sort of doing a, a, a analysis of the test sets um, using annotations. So, so we annotated the test sets very carefully. Um, and what we found uh, was that across sort of natural questions, trivia away and web questions, it turns out that about 60% of the test set questions only require this answer classification um, kind of behavior uh, to answer correctly. So, um, you know, if you were able to build a model that did perfect answer classification behavior, you would be able to get about 60% uh, performance on a test set, which in some cases is higher than the actual test set performances we get right now anyway. So um, that's kind of an interesting observation that maybe these data sets, you know, you don't have to, in order to do well and do a kind of serviceable job and maybe, you know, you know, put it in production and get that kind of like majority of answers answered correctly. Um, you don't necessarily have to generalize purely. You can, you can kind of do it in this kind of um, answer classification way to get, you know, most answer, most things answered correctly. But kind of even more intriguing was that we actually found that 30% of the test questions only need this question memorization behavior uh, to answer correctly. Hmm. Um, Seminar. Oh. Is that a question or is someone? Uh... No, I think just uh, some background. Uh, okay, that's fine. Um, no problem. So um, going back to this question memorization idea. So it turns out that 30% of the test questions have a power phrase with the same answer in the training set somewhere. And so about 30% of the test questions only need this question memorization behavior to answer correctly. So this paraphrase recognition essentially, which is sort of actually quite a high percentage, much higher than I thought going into this research. Um, and if you don't believe me, here are a few examples, say from, from natural questions. Say we have an answer, Jason Marsden, uh, a test question, who plays Max's voice in a goofy movie? And in a, a training set, there's just a very, very similar question, who does Max voice in a goofy movie? And so and then a similar thing here with this person called Alan Shearer. Um, and then like, you know, these kind of vary in difficulty, but most of them are very simple. So an example of a slightly you know, more inf like natural language inferency one would be uh, say Francisco Pizarro with the test question, who led the conquest of Incas in South America? And maybe try to kind of recognize that that is probably a paraphrase of the training question, conquistador who defeated the Incan empire in Peru. So those are these, these, these competencies of, 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 of question answering and kind of roughly what's required, like, you know, what's required to uh, get good performance on the test set. The next thing to think about is like, actually how well do our models do on these question competencies? Um, and actually, you know, if we say, look at the overall performance of these models, say here's a, a RAG, a retrieve and read uh, style model. Um, overall on natural questions, it's getting 44% correct. And then BART, which is a closed book QA model, overall getting about 27% correct. But how does that break down across the competencies? You know, what competencies are these models actually exhibiting and how well can they do on each one? Well, if I reveal this, you kind of see this interesting picture that, that RAG is, you know, able to get about 71% of the questions that require only this power phrase recognition correct. Um, and that's quite high, uh, but this is also quite like an easy, you know, these are the easy ones, I guess. Um, and it can get about 35% of the answer classification ones uh, correct. Uh, and that's, you know, a lot lower, but still like a non-trivial number. And it can get about 25% of the ones that require this pure generalization behavior correct. Um, and if you add all this up together, you get an overall score of about 44% overall. Um, whereas if we look at the BART, closed book QA model, we kind of see something interesting that actually almost all of its uh, performance is coming from question memorization and only a very small amount from, from these more challenging things. So, so it's kind of really just acting as a memorizer of its uh, question answer pairs it's seen during training. And so uh, a lot of those thoughts about, you know, maybe it's uh, captured lots of knowledge in its pre-training. And as we fine tune it with question answer pairs, it's learning to, you know, retrieve 
from its uh, pre-training kind of knowledge that it's stored in its parameters doesn't actually seem to be much of the case. It's more that it's just memorizing its fine tuning data and just doing this kind of pure, like very simple um, retrieval in a sense um, from its training set. So what we wanted to do is think about, okay, could we think about a, an explicit version of what this BART closed book QA model seems to be doing? And I quite like explicit or non-parametric approaches because you get a lot more uh, kind of control over what's going on. Um, and we can do things like add or remove um, data and, and sort of understand um, what's going on in, in a much kind of uh, more intimate way than just in this kind of like black boxy neural way. So what I'm going to propose is, is a QA pair retriever where we'll have this knowledge base of, of question answer pairs, which for now is just the training set. So in the same way that the BART closed book model had the training set and kind of memorized it or indexed it, and then at test time, it was sort of retrieving, you know, latently um, from its uh, training set that it's stored in its parameters. Let's try and do this in an explicit way. So we'll have the training set QA pairs, and then we'll have a question that will come in, and the retriever will retrieve the most similar question from, from the training set to try and answer that question. And because there's quite a lot of this um, overlap between train and test, um, a lot of this question memorization behavior, you can actually do, you know, non-trivial, non-trivially well here. Um, and you can get like a, a certain number of questions correct. Uh, but ultimately, you know, maybe your retriever isn't powerful enough. And so what we can do, you know, say that we get a, a question and it retrieves a very similar question, but the answer isn't quite right. Uh, we can boost its accuracy by retrieving the top K from the retriever and then passing that into a re-ranker, which has like more sort of advanced um, natural language understanding and, and, and cross encoding and these kind of things that will allow it to do some kind of inference and maybe bring in some of that parametric knowledge or kind of um, you know, magic uh, uh, neural stuff um, that will enable us to actually like re-rank this top K and pick the answer, which is, more, which is sort of the, the best or most likely. Um, and we can do this as well. Uh, and so this uh, idea of having this QA pair retriever followed by this cross encoding re-ranker, um, I mean, it exists in, in various places in, in the literature. We've called it repack. Um, for now, as in the model name is called Repack. Um, and we want to see how well this performs when we supply this Repack retriever with just this training set of natural questions, those 100,000 training examples that you usually use to fine tune a QA model. Um, and we treat that as a knowledge base to retrieve from. And if we do this and we compare it to, say, these, these models we looked at in the previous slides, we can see this QA pair retriever actually, you know, performs relatively well, considering it's only retrieving from, from the training set, and it actually outperforms the BART closed book QA model. It's better at doing this memorization thing, which the BART model is kind of only really able to do, and it's uh, doing a reasonable job with this answer classification thing as well, um, thanks to its re-ranker, which is kind of looking over the top K retrieved things from the retriever and trying to figure out which is the best, I guess, answer from these similar questions uh, to the question I was asked. But by design, of course, it can't actually do any of this QA generalization because by definition, these QA generalization questions, these hard ones, are ones where the answer doesn't appear anywhere in the training set. And because the QA pair retriever right now is retrieving from the training set, it can never answer those correctly. Um, and, you know, that's a shame. And 31% is, is okay, but we want to get, you know, higher scores. Like we want to build a system which is going to be able to answer lots of questions correctly. And so uh, here we kind of come back to this idea of like why it might be a good idea to augment that data set or this knowledge base of question answer pairs that this model is retrieving from. And so our aim is to generate question answer pairs at scale in order to try and preempt and cache the kinds of questions that we may be asked at test time without knowledge of what the test time questions uh, will be, but try and just sort of preempt and cache and predict what people might ask based on the training set. Um, and if we do this well, what we'll be doing is converting these really challenging question answer pair generalization questions, these difficult ones that need this generalization behavior and these sort of medium difficulty answer classification questions. We're going to be converting those hard questions into these simple question memorization questions, because if we've sort of preempted every question you could ever ask, all you have to do is solve this kind of retrieval or paraphrase recognition task. Um, or an alternative view is kind of reducing open domain question answering 
into community question answering by kind of having this simulated community which ask and answer loads and loads and loads of questions. It's kind of a different way of thinking about it. And so this leads us on to this section of like expanding the coverage of question and answer uh, of this of this knowledge base, um, which is where the, the pack um, uh, idea comes in. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is essentially increase the coverage of the knowledge uh, of, of the uh, QA pairs that we have to 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 for, in our QA pair knowledge base um, by generating these probable question and answer pairs offline at scale. Or kind of thinking about another way, convert knowledge in the form of text on Wikipedia into the form of question and answer pairs for our semi-structured knowledge base that we're going to retrieve from. Uh, and the way we do this is by training a passage selector um, for Wikipedia passages. Uh, and so what this will do is basically classify how uh, natural questions a, a passage is in, in Wikipedia uh, based on a kind of contrastive learning approach. Um, sort of trying to predict whether a passage is included in the natural questions training data or not. And we can use this passage selector to, to rank Wikipedia passages and select ones which are kind of likely, uh, but weren't actually included in the natural questions training data. And the interpretation is that these passages are things that maybe the test time user might be interested in um, and maybe good candidates for generating question answer pairs from. And so here's a, an example, like we've, we've uh, extracted, we've, we've kind of selected this passage about this tomb uh, somewhere. Um, and that might be interest to someone who's asking a sort of general knowledge question. And then we're going to take these passages and run them through an answer extractor, uh, which will extract likely answers from the passage. And again, this is supervised on, on, on natural questions data or trivia QA data, or potentially can be um, implemented with a name entity recognition system as well. Uh, we've looked at both. Uh, and what this will do is say extract, you know, a likely answer to a question um, that, yeah, that would be asked on this passage. So we've extracted the answer three. And then finally, we want to generate a question. So we'll take this passage and this answer and generate uh, train a question generator when we use bar large uh, bar base for this uh, to generate a question. And then we've done it kind of we've, we've, we've achieved our, our goal. We have a question answer pair that represents some of the knowledge that's in this passage. Um, okay, but there are some issues that that kind of uh, are outstanding right now. Um, one is that we might have generated a question which is kind of nonsense and doesn't really make sense. Um, and this can happen, uh, or it might hallucinate things. Uh, so we want to apply a um, what's called a consistency filter to ensure that the questions we generate are consistent. Um, consistent in the sense that the answer that the question was generated from is indeed the answer to the question. And there hasn't gone something wrong in the question generation, and so this is done, you know, fairly frequently in, in the in the generation literature. Uh, what you'll do is take a generated question, and usually uh, the passage it was generated from, and then run it through a machine reading comprehension model, kind of squad style, to produce an answer, and then check if the answer matches the answer you started with, and if it does, you keep it; otherwise, you reject that question. Um, and we're going to get into more about how it's very important to, uh, for, for our purposes, uh, how you implement this filtering. Uh, but for now, it uh, suffices to say that you know we have this filter, and uh, things that pass the filter will be added uh, uh, to the pack knowledge base. Um, I will actually go and talk about this consistency filter a little bit more right now. Um, so one other issue that that we have is that we don't just want a question to make sense in the local context, i.e. a question that has loads of uh, pronouns or only makes sense when you have access to the passage it was generated from is no good for us uh, because we want to build these standalone question answer pairs that go into the knowledge base and kind of aren't really connected to the passage they were generated from. Uh, and so we actually use an open domain QA uh, model to do this consistency filter where we pass it only the question and the open domain QA model comes up with the answer. And only if that answer matches uh, the original answer, the question generated from will keep it. We call this kind of global filtering where uh, we kind of have to filter um, without access to this local knowledge, this, this local piece of context or passage that the, uh, the, question, uh, the question was generated from compared to what we call local filtering, which is the kind of traditional way of doing machine reading comprehension. And doing this is really, really important for high quality uh, questions and really good performance downstream. I can't stress enough how 
For us, it was very, very important to use this global filtering. Are you use an open domain QA model for filtering, not a um, local um, machine reading comprehension model for filtering. So uh, I guess I have a, another slide for this, which may give a, a slightly different um, uh, intuitive uh, look at how this works. But again, we're going to start with Wikipedia, perform passage ranking to select passages that we care about, and then extract a bunch of answers from those passages, generate questions from them, and then filter those questions using our global filtering approach, and the ones that survive will go into the pack knowledge base. And that leaves us with pack or the probably asked questions uh, knowledge base, which is 65 million question answer pairs. So this is really big, like compared to say the size of, of normal training sets that we have um, in uh, open domain QA. So about 650 times the size of natural questions in trivia QA. And we generated this from the first billion words of Wikipedia according to our passage ranker or our passage prior, I guess. And this represents the sort of top half of Wikipedia according to our prior. So we stopped uh, generating when we didn't see improvements downstream and it took about 50% of going through Wikipedia to see that um, stop uh, those improvements slow down. Um, okay, so that's how we generate the thing. And now we're going to get into some of the results. Uh, so here I have results on, on, on natural questions uh, and a bunch of different models here. We have a large close bit QA model getting about 26%. Uh, T5 11 billion uh, with self supervised uh, special uh, pre training tasks that are supposed to make it better at close with QA, getting about 36. Um, a new system called Dense Phrases, um, which is a real time QA model, um, sort of designed to be uh, fast in inference. Um, and it does quite well, gets about 41%. Uh, we have RAG, uh, which is a retrieve and read model. And then we have FID large, Fusion Indie Coder large, which is the current state of the art. Um, you know, probably still is, and it, it's 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 very close right now. But let's say Fusion Indie Coder large being a recent state of the art approach gets slightly over fifty percent. Um, how does Repack perform? So Repack, uh, when it's been supplied with um, the pack knowledge base to retrieve from, rather than just the training set to retrieve from, uh, we can see that it actually performs uh, pretty well, like uh, outperforming RAG. A little bit below um, uh, the fusion in decoder large model. But as I said in the very early slides, we can combine this repack model with um, fit large in this kind of back off approach where we'll usually answer with repack. But if the confidence is very low, we'll then defer to fit large. And if we do that, we'll see uh, we're able to uh, achieve a, a state of the art result, um, if that is even important to you. And we'll do that at about um, half the latency of, of fit large on average, which is cool. Uh, a couple of like experimental settings um, I mentioned before, and I really stressed uh, that um, it's very important to um, implement your filtering correctly. Um, so if we don't have any uh, filter, uh, our repack model will achieve about 31% accuracy, which is actually no better really than it was um, with just the tra training set to retreat from. So all of that question generation uh, all of these millions and millions of QA pairs were actually like so noisy that they actually didn't really change the overall result. So filtering for us is really important, number one, because without a filtering, you don't see any real benefit. Um, if we use a local filter, we see an improvement about 5%, uh, which is good. Um, so there's machine reading comprehension model to filter the generated QA pairs. So that's you know an improvement, which is good. So um, it's better than nothing. And local filtering should kind of be your minimum, I think. Um, but really, it's very important, uh, in, in our case at least, to use this global filtering using the open domain QA model to filter out uh, question and answer pairs. Generally, it takes, uh, it, it takes care of a lot of cases where you have these ambiguous questions that you've generated that could have like many, many different answers. Um, and the machine reading comprehension model already can't handle those cases well at all uh, because uh, things have become significantly less ambiguous uh, when you have access to the passage it was generated from. So things like, you know, how old is he uh, would be the kind of question you might generate. And that's a terrible question to put in the knowledge base. Uh, we don't know who he is, it could be anyone. Um, but it would still be easily answerable if you had a passage that had only one uh, age named in it. And that's why, you know, this difference between the local and global filtering is so pronounced, I think. Uh, but once you've done global filtering, we have this sort of strong pattern that basically the more question answer pairs you generate, as long as they're globally filtered, you'll see an improvement in performance. So um, the first thing is that uh, using more 
uh, generating more questions per answer span. So you have an answer in a passage. There may be several different questions you could ask that will have that same answer, or maybe different like phrasings of the question um, that you would ask about that answer entity. And so uh, we have a beam size of four uh, where we generate question answer pairs. And we just thought like, well, rather than throwing away the three, you know, uh, hypotheses that weren't the highest scoring, uh, let's keep them and uh, run those with the global filter as well. And if we do that, we see you know, a nice one-ish percent improvement in accuracy. Um, and then uh, what I'm gonna call sort of diverse model. So implementing this generation pipeline with two different styles of model. Um, one with, our, I think it was named entity answers uh, and trained just on, on, on one um, QA data set and another that was using a learned answer extractor and, and multi-task uh, QA generator. Um, improve results further and so kind of the, the story here is just like as long as you globally filter the questions it does seem that just throwing more and more question answer pairs in improves results and i don't think we're quite saturated there either like i think this approach would improve a bit more uh with more coverage so um in the next part i want to take a closer look at repack and do a sort of a uh, quick look at uh, some of the other behaviors that we see with repack in particular, this kind of idea of, of selective question answering. So um, uh, this sense that uh, answering a question wrong is worse than not answering at all. Uh, and that is the case you know, in a lot of uh, question answering. So say if you work with smart speakers, it's kind of annoying to get a wrong answer. And over time, you lose trust in the system because you're not sure there is right or wrong. And it's better for it to say, I don't know, sometimes. Uh, but when it does answer, you give a high probability of getting an answer correct. Uh, and so this idea of selective QA uh, has a bunch of different names in, in the literature from different, from different times. Uh, we call it selective QA to, to match some, some, some recent work, uh, but people call it different things. Um, so what I'm doing here is visualizing how well Repack can do this task compared to this Fusion Indie Coder state-of-the-art model. Uh, and this is a, uh, it's called a risk coverage plot. Um, and I guess if you haven't seen one of these things before, it can take a little while to figure out what's going on. Uh, so what's going on is we have the QA accuracy of the model on the test set um, of the questions that it chooses to answer. And then it has on the, uh, on the, on the um, X axis here, how many of the test questions it's choosing to answer. So if we look at 100% here, this is the kind of standard numbers you'll see in, in the uh, overall accuracy uh, for a uh, model, um, you know, in the tables and in a normal open domain QA paper, you see here that, that FID is getting something like 50% and uh, Repack is performing a little bit worse. Then if we start to basically order the test set answers by the confidence the model assigns to each answer and then start to threshold and say, okay, model, uh, answer 80% of the test questions uh, answer the ones that you think are uh, you're most likely to get correct based on your answer confidence. Uh, and you can see that both models have an improvement in accuracy uh, as you threshold, which means they're both kind of like their answer um, confidence is correlated with whether how, whether how likely they are to get it right. But this is very, very flat for Fusion Indie Coder, this state-of-the-art reproven uh, system, whereas our approach repack is, is a lot more um, curved, which is showing like better calibration, essentially. Uh, or it's better at selective QA. So say if you had an operating point where you want a model to answer roughly 50% of the questions is asked, um, but you want to optimize, you, you want to get like the highest accuracy on those 50% that it chooses to answer. Uh, that We do that by looking at, uh, say, the 50% mark, which would be something like this, and then drawing a line up. And you'd see that FID would answer about 60% of questions correctly whereas uh, Repack would answer about 75% of questions correctly at this 50% um, threshold. So you can see that you know, if you care about the selected QA, the type of model that you choose, uh, what is state of the art for you will actually change. So um, from, from answering everything correctly, you maybe want to use FID if you care at all costs about accuracy. But if you care about selected QA and still want good accuracy, something like Repack may be a better option for you. Uh, I've talked about this before, so I'm going to skip this slide. Um, and then we have inference speed. So I talked about this very briefly at the beginning, um, but I want to note that first of all, that Fusion and Decoder Large uh, has you know high accuracy, but it's very slow because it needs to process lots and lots of text uh, 
you know, a lot of this accuracy comes from conditioning on, say, the top 100 retrieved passages uh, from Wikipedia to generate an answer. And that's, number one, computationally uh, expensive and, as a result, slow. Um, and also not so great for interpretability, right, because uh, you have to look at 100 passages to figure out, you know, why have you got this particular short entity answer? Um, so it's very, you know, very accurate, but very slow. Um, but if you want a really fast QA model, you can choose to just use the repack retriever. And we can build very efficient nearest neighbor indices, which means that this approach can be made very, very fast. So um, if you say like you're, you're okay with getting about 40% of questions correct, 41, 42, uh, you can process up to 1400 questions a second in parallel, which means you can answer a lot, a lot of questions very quickly. Uh, which could be useful maybe for like actual like deployment task for a user, but also kind of unlocks things like, I don't know, having a question answer in the loop. If you're training some other kind of model and you need to do inference very fast to supply it with training data, if you're trying to distill or something, I don't know. Um, this is a useful behavior just to be able to note that you can get very fast question answering um, from a system like Repack if you don't use the re-ranker. Um, but if you care more about accuracy, you can add these re-rankers in and the accuracy will Will dramatically improve um, and you'll get a, a performance hit in terms of the speed of the system but it's still about 12 times faster than fit large um, and so if we take this highest performing repack model and do this back off thing uh, with fit large you can see that we'll get an improvement in accuracy over here um, and it will be about twice as fast because um, uh, it turns out that sort of threshold that uh, we chose uh, meant that Repack was answering about half of the questions and Fit Large was answering about half the questions. So overall, your amortized questions per second is about twice as fast as, as Fit Large. Uh, okay, I have very little time left, but I can uh, just quickly uh, go through and revisit these, these competencies we talked about in terms of uh, what questions uh, a model is getting right or wrong um, and uh, uh, what are the, the qualitative um, aspects of the questions it gets right or wrong. Uh, and one thing we did was take these closed book QA models, like the BART closed book QA model, and then rather than just fine tuning it on natural questions, we can fine tune it on the pack QA pairs instead and give it like a much, much larger set of question answer pairs to train on. And so it can memorize a lot of those question answer pairs and its parameters. And if we do that, we'll see you know, an improvement in, in its accuracy overall. And we'll see that it starts to get things that are answer classification and QA generalization. And this is kind of like a memori uh, I don't know, generalization by memorization uh, kind of effect, because what it's done is memorized some of the question answer pairs in PAC, which uh, are useful for answering test questions, uh, but are not actually you know, overlapped with the training set of natural questions. So we've kind of like the PAC pipeline is generating questions, uh, which allow the model to generalize uh, on, the, on the natural questions test set. But you can see that actually, like, maybe it has a capacity issue because you can see that its question memorization bar has kind of shrunk. So of the ones it was getting right, if it was just fine-tuned on natural questions, it's getting maybe some of those wrong now. Um, so it's kind of not performing as well as it could if it had sort of infinite memory capacity. So what we could do then is maybe, like, do a final natural questions only fine-tune for this model, and we'll see that uh, question memorization bar kind of increase back up again, uh, which is cool. But you'll see like a very slight decrease on the QA generalization and answer classification performance if you do that. So it's kind of starting to already forget some of the facts or QA pairs that it memorized from, from PAC. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we can look at how Repack performs when it's retrieving from knowledge base of natural questions in PAC. And if we do this, we can see this really nice behavior that basically uh, it hasn't really lost very much at all of its previous question memorization ability. So it's still very precise. So of the questions before, it could retrieve as paraphrases of test questions uh, from the natural questions training set. It's still doing that, uh, maybe like a very slight decrease. But you see these really big improvements in terms of answer classification and QA generalization, these kind of harder questions that all models kind of struggle to get right. Um, but Repack can do it because of PAC, because PAC has preempted a lot of those test questions and they kind of exist or a paraphrase of them exists somewhere in the pack uh, KB. And so all repack has to do is retrieve them. So really its mechanism of operation is, is very much just paraphrase recognition and some sort of clever re-ranking. Um, but it's still able to answer a lot of these questions that required you know, generalization nominally uh, from the training uh, set. 
Uh, cool. And now we have, uh, we're at 9.45, so I'm going to skip um, all of this stuff on efficient QA, uh, which isn't really relevant. Uh, it was kind of just um, how to uh, uh, optimize these models for really, really small footprints. Um, but again, it's kind of more engineering than, than research, so it's maybe for a different audience. Uh, and I just want to quickly uh, highlight a bunch of, of, of really important related work, which I haven't talked about that much, uh, but things in machine reading comprehension and then extractive QA. Uh, this is non exhaustive. Uh, open domain QA, uh, neural memory models, knowledge grounded dialogue, these things are kind of really uh, important for, for RAG. And then as a result, kind of inspired some of the stuff we did later in, in PAC. Uh, non parametric memory models, uh, Realm, uh, big uh, influence on RAG and, and hence on some of the other things. And of course, the recent uh, parametric memory literature and, and open domain QA literature. Uh, and then to thank the collaborators um, and UCMLP and FAIR and the other folks who make all the uh, software that we use uh, make our work possible. Um, cool. So that is um, all I had. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Let's um, get into questions, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for giving this uh, wonderful talk. So, uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions from the Zoom chart. Maybe we first address, address them. 